Aha. Okay. So welcome to a tour of the, an armchair tour of the Hudson Valley in the Ice Age. And I will be your guide. My name is Bill Tool. I've been a resident here for about two years. And after retiring from IBM, I decided I would be interested in giving courses on the history of science. And so this is one of those in a series. And although I told you you didn't need warm coats, I thought I might, but I see I don't, so I will take mine off. There's nothing under here. That Now let's see if we can get this. Let's see if we can get this back under control. How do I make that back to smaller? Yeah. This is on Zoom. Oh, this is through Zoom. Okay. Edits restarted. We can do that. I probably touched it. There we go. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. All, All right. So just like Good. Here. No, I didn't take those away. All right. Thank you for your technical support. It's always welcome. So it's November, twenty-two thousand and twenty-one years before the present. So come with me on an armchair tour of the Hudson Valley. The images are by Google Earth. Our guidebook is the excellent account, The Hudson Valley in the Ice Age by Robert and Johanna Titus, who are local uh, geologists, geologists. And this will be our guidebook. So what is an ice age? Well, over its lifetime, the Earth has cycled between periods of warm temperatures and periods of cold temperatures. These latter are called ice ages and are characterized by massive accumulations of ice on the land and a corresponding drop in sea levels. There is scientific debate about the causes of these cycles, which have periods measured in tens of thousands of years. The consensus is that warmer winters have more snow, which melts less in cooler summers. And over the years, the snow accumulates, turning into glaciers characteristic of an ice age. So what can cause warmer winters? Well, small changes in the Earth's orbit, variations in its axial tilt, continental drift, lots and lots of ideas, and I don't think there's a final answer. But the combined factors result in a climate in which there is little thawing and hence a buildup of ice from year to year and thus an ice age. How did we get there? Okay, all right. So regardless of its cause, the earth has experienced many ice ages, the most recent ending about 13,400 years before the present. And during this period, there were several distinct ice sheets covering portions of the earth. Ice ages tend to obliterate each other. And so the most recent one is really the only one we have any information about. And that's the one we're talking about today. We give this particular ice sheet a name, the Laurentide ice sheet. And it, as you can see from the map, this has covered Canada and most of Northern US. For those of you who are new to the area, here's an orientation to the present. All of this area was covered by ice in the Ice Age. And I've shown you the approximate locations of Mount Marcy, which is the tallest peak in New York State, uh, Slide Mountain, which is one of the tall peaks in the Catskill Mountains, the Schwangunks, which are the ones the ridge that you see out your window, you see Long Island, 
the Hudson River, New York City, uh, Connecticut, and various other pieces. And we'll come back and talk some more about those, those places as we, as we take our tour. Actually, the Schwangunk Ridge, which we see out, I learned yesterday, the Schwangunk Ridge actually is considered to go all the way down into Virginia, although it starts in Rosendale. And I didn't realize it was that long, but the most spectacular area is, of course, the cliffs that are right outside of our door. So an ice age, buildup of ice, maybe a few hundred feet, hardly. The Laurentide ice sheet completely covered the Catskill Mountains and the Adirondacks, including Mount Marcy, which is over 5,000 feet tall. Think in terms of a one to two mile thick sheet of ice, layer of ice. And ice that thick puts a lot of pressure on the ground, compressing the land, turning the bottom of the ice pack into water, which flows downhill, taking the ice pack with it. This is a glacier. I've shown a map of typical elevations. The Laurentide sheet on the left is uh, 3,000 meters. I'll, I'll try to introduce you to the, to the metric system as we go along. Might as well get some more science into this. Uh, Mount Marcy, Slide Mountain, Lake Minnewaska, uh, the Storm King, and then the small ones are a, a the projected height of a glacier lake called Lake Albany that we'll come back to. And then current sea level and glacial sea level, which is much lower because of the ice, all the water was in the ice. And finally, the depth of something called the Hudson Canyon in New York Harbor that we'll come back to at the end. So you might ask if the pressure of the water formed the mountains. No, rock formation occurred millions of years before th this, as our lecture last week talked about. The Ice Age is only 20,000 years, not million years. But the rocks and the mountains are shaped by glacial activity. Local freezing and thawing and the pressure of a glacier can cause rocks to fracture. That's just a fancy name for break. And the fractured pieces can be carried along by the glacier as it, ex as it expanses, as it expands. But a glacier doesn't adva advance forever. If snowfall is less than the melting runoff, then the glacier will start to shrink and its advance will be halted. The face of a glacier may begin to retreat and the rocks and soil being pushed along and carried along are dropped, forming what is called a moraine. Glacial advance and retreat can happen several times during an ice age. So several moraines may be formed and we'll show you a map of where some of those are in the Hudson Valley. And the most southerly moraine associated with the ultimate advance of the glacier is called a terminal moraine. And so, so much for generalities. Any questions before we get on with our tour? Seeing none, let's go, let's go. So in the middle of the ice age, there's not much to be seen, it's all ice. So let's move our tour forward in time about 8,000 years to the end of the ice age and look and see what the retreating ice glacier left. We'll start with visiting the gunks. Glaciers carrying rocks and sand can cause scratches on the bedrock. These are called striations and remnants of these can be seen from the main parking lot at the Minnewaska State Park. Now this particular rock is not in Minnewaska as it turns out, Gilgul Earth can go anywhere and so they picked, I picked this picture as a better example of the striations that you can see along the rock. And, uh, but obviously the glacier filled the valley and the ice ground against the sides of the rock found formations, pushing rock against rock and creating the steep sides and the cliffs that we're seeing, that we're familiar with uh, from our windows. 
This phenomenon is called glacial plucking. And one example of particular interest is what is called Gertrude's nose in the gunks on the left-hand side of the picture. And sometimes glaciers will pick up a big rock and carry it along and then leave it behind. And this is called a glacial erratic. And this particular one is called Patterson's pellet, uh, a large pellet. And both of these can be seen from the hiking, hiking trails of Minnewaska State Park. On a somewhat larger scale, and let me see if I can show you this. If you go northwest of Saugerties to the foothills of the Catskills, then you would notice that this, the, if you look, sight along the, the cliffs, there's a straight line here, which I've drawn in, separating the mountains from the valley. This is called the Wall of Manitou, which is gouged out by glacial activity. And Manitou is the Algonquin word for the Great Spirit. And I had a, thought I had, there's, and there is a, a topographical map, again, showing the, the line in the middle here and the cliffs and of the Catskills going into the valley very suddenly and very evenly along the straight line. And this thing has a mind of its own. And, and by the way, you can see the, the topographical map shows the different, the fact that the boundary between Green County and Ulster County is, is almost exactly on that line. So as I mentioned before, glaciers advance and retreat, and an, and an advancing glacier contains rocks and soils that grind against the ground, creating holes that will ultimately fill with water. So a retreating glacier leaves rocks and soils behind, forming hills and moraines. The great terminal moraine of the Laurentide Glacier forms the northern half of Long Island and continues across the entire United States. So glacial activity is not unique to Hudson Valley. And remember that the water comprised in the glacier causes a decrease in sea level. It was several hundred feet lower than it is now, now being 20th century, 21st century. I have to remember which is, what well, since we're doing a talk 13,000 years before the 21st century, what is now? So I'll try to keep you abreast of that. And that was, you know, the sea level was below the continental shelf. So a moraine is a mixture, is a mixture of rock, soil, and sand, and often with very large boulders embedded in the, in the, um, the soil. I happened across this excavation at the Women's Studio Workshop up in uh, Rosendale, where they were building a new building and took this picture of a typical content of, an, of a moraine. And you can see all the rocks that are in, just in the soil. This is a picture of the area from a topographical map. The X marks the spot of the photograph. And the fifth lake is also called Williams Lake if, you're, uh, if somebody talks to you about that. So we're going to see topographical maps again. So let's make sure we understand what's being shown and how to interpret it. So we have features. We have roads. We have railroads. There used to be a ra railroad in, in this area. Please don't do that to me. <laughs> All right, I think, and of course the water features, but the most thing I want to, want to call your attention to is these squiggly lines that are brown lines 
which are contour lines. And the reason it's a topographical map that shows you how high things are. So for example, this, if you can see my cursor, this is, is 400 feet above sea level. And if you were to walk around along that brown line, you wouldn't go up or you wouldn't go down. So it's a line of constant elevation. And the dark brown lines are separated by 100 feet elevation. And the light brown lines are separated by 20 feet. If you think about it a little bit, lines that are closer together represent a steep slope. For example, here. Whereas lines that are farther apart represent areas that are relatively level. So back to retreating glaciers. A retreating glacier means that the leading edge is melting faster than the ice sheet is moving down the slope and is usually associated with a warming climate. So if, but if the temperature decreases, the glacial retreat may be interrupted, causing the glacier to advance again uh, temporarily before resuming its complete retreat. So it can go back and forth. And so that each time it stops going forward and starts going back, it forms a moraine, but not the terminal moraine. And scientists have constructed a map on the left-hand side here showing the various moraines created by the, the retreat and, and readvance of the Laurentide Glacier. I've marked in blue the ones that are in our area. Uh, number nine, which is the long blue line here, is called Rosendale. And so that would be in this, in this area, just north of us. But all the way from you know, the lower parts of the Hudson Valley all the way up to Albany, the glacier start, stopped and started. So let's talk a little bit about moraines. As I said, a moraine is basically a hill of glacial material. A guidebook spends some time talking about it and has several, several photographs of the moraines, which unfortunately are in black and white. But he, he in the, but they described where the picture was taken. So using Google Earth, I was able to retake that picture, uh, showing the moraine, which is again you can see the outline of the hill, on the left hand side picture, and from a distance on the right. I'm speculating that that's uh, uh, Titus's house, but I don't know that for sure. But these were in Columbia County, which is the one northeast of us. And this is typical landscape of, of a moraine. The other possibility, as I said, is they can gouge out the land, which gets filled with water. And these are called kettles. There are a lot of them around the small lakes. This is uh, Lake Chadiki Lake, just east of here in, in the town of Lloyd. And there's also Lily Lake, and all of those are are kettle, officially kettles left by glacial activity. Now, as the glacier uh, retreated, it, it's always very wet. And sometimes it'll form a lake, but sometimes it just uh, leaves a, a, a lot of wet uh, vegetation or wet area in which vegetation can grow. And if that happens over years, then it can form black mud, which is very, uh, very fertile. And these are called drowned lands. And there's examples of that in Orange County that had been the, the bottom of Lake Wallkill. And these are the agricultural lands of Orange County. And the right-hand picture shows the location of what's called Mount Adam. There's also a Mount Eve in the area. And this is a picture from the road of the, the uh, rows of agricultural products 
with Mount Adam in the background, and those would have stuck up as islands in Lake Wallkill, which was a lake formed as the glacier retreated. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes all you get is a swamp. This is on Route 199 between Red Hook and Pine Plains. And you can see on the left from the air, this is actually, this is actually a swamp. And from the road on the right, you can see the, the standing water and the cattails and so on. So again, this is formed by the glacier and just has uh, no particular agricultural use because it's not very large. So the retreating glacier formed several lakes that were left over when the, when the ice moved away from it, but they were trapped in, in the, in the, uh, on the land. And the US Ge Geological Service has gone back and they didn't actually see these lakes, but they surmised that there were lakes called Lake Hudson, Lake Hackensack, Lake Passaic, Lake Flushing, and the terminal moraine there is shown as that white line, which they say goes right through the middle of Long Island. And these are all in lower, in lower part of the Hudson Valley. And we're going, and they don't bother to show what I call Lake Albany, which is just north of this area. And that's where we're going next. So just above that area, Lake Albany was formed as the glacier retreated back north of Albany. And it ran all the way from West Point at the southern end, where the mountains cross and make a very narrow pass through the uh, through that area, all the way up, essentially to, to be connecting what, what, with what will become Lake George and Lake Champlain. At its greatest width, it, they're surmising that it's almost 25 miles across, and of course, several hundred miles uh, long. And this illustration was prepared by the USGS and shows Again, the Lord, um, Lake Albany, and again, it was blocked by you know, uh, glacial debris that basically filled in the area about where West Point is now. And so there wasn't much drainage out of there. And then as water filled in from the glacier melting, then it formed this big lake. Now this particular illustration shows a smooth shoreline, but you know that that's not really true. The lake must have extended up into the watershed. And can we say anything more about the location of the shoreline of Lake Albany? The game I have played with people when I've given this talk before is to see whether or not they had lakeshore frontage in their house. So, the, the guidebook, the book by Titus, is, suggests that we have a way of getting some information about that. And that is that any uh, river or creek that flowed into the lake would have left sand and so on in a delta, much like the Mississippi River Delta. And if we look at those deltas, we can give some idea of where the shore of the lake was. So I said, OK, we can look at that. And there's places like. Uh, the Catterskill Creek coming out of the Catskills, the Platykill Creek coming out of the um, uh, northern part of, of Kingston, the Sawkill River, um, the Sopus Creek, Rondout Creek, Wallkill River, and called Roloff Jensen Kill, which is a large creek in Dutchess and Columbia County. And there were, there were our deltas that you can see in the topographical maps. Uh, for example, in Pal Palinville, Elizaville, Mount Marion, and the Hurley Flats, and of course, the Wallkill Valley that we're in now. And so I said, and here, here are the pictures of the deltas. Again, the, this is, of course, in the present, 
rather than 8,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago. But you can see that the topographical map shows steep, steep canyons or steep cliffs, but then level areas where people have built and so on. So that suggests that the, the shore of the lake was, was there. The interesting thing as I looked at these is there, the current elevation is 200 feet above sea level in all of these. So that suggested to me that if I followed the 200 foot contour through all of the maps and the contour maps, I could, I could get an approximation to the sh shoreline of Lake Albany. And so I did that. So these are some topographical maps of the, uh, of the um, Kingston area and overlaid with the, with the blue, which is the, the conjectured extent of Lake Albany. And this is where the, this is a map seam. And it shows Red Hook, which is partially underwater, Rhinebeck, which is mostly underwater, Downtown Kingston is completely underwater. The throughway is completely underwater. And the, the lake went up the Hurley Flats, uh, which is the Esopus Creek, and also the Rondout Creek that we'll come to. And so that was an interesting exercise working with maps and graphics and so on. Uh, and as I said, if you lived in, in, in Rhinebeck or something, I could tell you now whether or not you had a lakeshore property. This gives you another example and shows you why the throughway is uh, underwater. And this is Rhinebeck. And again, the blue is where the lake was and represents a 200 foot contour. This is, I used to live in Rosendale, so I figured I had to do Rosendale and the Rondout Creek is, um, flows through, but there's a lot of hills there so that the, the, the lake would have been very uh, contorted sh shoreline. Anytime there is a delta or anything, there's uh, likely to be sand deposited. And in fact, on the right-hand side of the picture, you can show a, a sand pit labeled. And that was actually right, right below my house in, in Rosendale. Uh, so I knew that I had lakefront property. And I said, well, it must also be true for the Wallkill River. So I followed a sequence of maps from, and this is of course not facing north now, the Hudson River is the lower right corner and you're following the Rondout Creek up. Sturgeon Pond is uh, created by the a hydroelectric dam that replaced a waterfall. And then New Paltz is in the upper left-hand corner of the picture. And fortunately, right here, we're at 300 feet. So we were dry. But down, downtown and um, along the, uh, uh, what's this, this street? Um, you got on the street, you know, they were, they were wet. Of course, this is conjecture, but I thought it was, you know, it gives you an idea of what, what a glacier would have left. And again, this is the lakefront from New Paltz. And again, the blue is the projected uh, lake. And we are, we are that apple orchard in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, topographical maps don't get off, don't get updated very often. Well, Lake Albany no, no longer exists, so it must have drained, and I'll come back to that. But what happened to the streams and the kills and the, and the rivers that flowed into Lake Albany? Well, when the lake drained, the streams were much higher than the uh, exposed bottom, and so they would have had to have formed waterfalls that eroded the delta and the downstream surface. And of course, these waterfalls are things that powered uh, early development of industry in the Hudson Valley. 
And this example, this is from uh, Philmont up in Columbia County, shows one of the waterfalls that's still, still around, again, uh, courtesy of Google Earth, from above to the left and uh, from in front to the right. And I was able to stay dry through the whole time. I mentioned the role of Jansen Kill. It actually starts at 200 feet in Elizaville and then Fort Canyon. And if you drive, drive north on 9G in Columbia County, you go down a big hill to cross, cross, cross. I'm going to have to do this live. This is 9G. You're going to cross the Gulf of Lancaster, Gulf of Kansas-Kill on a bridge, which is more or less a water level. But if you look to the right, you can see the cliffs and the canyon has torn wide uh, because water started at 200 feet and went to sea level. It's got to make, got to make a canyon, it wrote everything away. So what other features might a glacier have caused? The one that I find interesting that I didn't know at all until I read this book, the guidebook, is they're called drumlins, not gremlins, drumlins. And in addition to the moraines and the kettles and the deltas, the Hudson Valley has many hills that, that seem to be moraine material, but it's shaped by water flow that, that lasts that, float around them you know after the glacier melted and the characteristic shape is that of an inverted spoon they're easy to identify in a topographical map and they're called drumlins and drumlins sometimes occur in swarms but in the hudson valley are pretty much separated so here are some examples that you may have seen but may not have appreciated so in columbia county there is a cemetery on interestingly enough, called the Cemetery Road, as you show on the right hand picture. And you can see the, the characteristic shape of a long oval in the, uh, in the topographical map on the right and the, the photo of, from Google Earth on the left of the cemetery that's on the top, top of that drumlin. If you drive north on US 9, and cross the border from Dutchess to, to Columbia County and look to the left, then you see this picture on the left, which is this hill out in the middle of a field, a large hill out in the middle of a field. And if you look again at the topographical map on the right-hand side, you can see it's a very characteristic inverted spoon shape. And that's again, another drumlin. I was looking for Ulster County drumlins, and I think going east of New Paltz on 299, that in the town of Lloyd, you pass Black Creek, and then there's an, uh, basically a heavily wooded area uh, north of 299. There's actually some, some hills in there, which are hard to see because it's all wooded. But I'm, I'm pointing to a couple that I think are probably drumlins. Uh, in the map there. But I'll have to go back in the winter and see if I can see the, see the actual hill formation. So if you want to impress your friends or confound your enemies, you can identify some of our local hills as drumlins and they'll think that you're very erudite. By the way, Illinois Mountain is probably not a drumlin. So let's go back to Lake Albany and toss, toss, discuss the one feature that I haven't talked about, and that is the Hudson River. So Lake Albany was formed from meltwater from the retreating Laurentide ice sheet glacier, as I said earlier, and it had nearly no outflow. North of Lake Albany, the ice sheet still covered the land and an ice dam prevented meltwater from, the, from flowing into Lake Albany. 
So this meltwater covered parts of Canada what became, and what became the Great Lakes, shown on the left-hand side here. I'm, I'm afraid to use this anymore. Shown on the left-hand side of, of the, the picture there. But at some point, the, the ice dam broke. And the, our guidebook calls it a bad day on Wall Street. The impounded water breached the ice dam and poured into Lake Albany carrying a huge wall of water, which pounded into the moraine and the rocks damming the southern end, carrying all of that and rushing south across the land and flooding into the sea, forming what is now New York Harbor. The water eroded the land in its path, carving a deep channel, which is the Hudson River, the Palisades, and the Hudson Canyon. And there's somebody did a calculation, they thought that took 88 days. So here's examples of where we, where we now see it, the Hudson River on the left and the Palisades on the right. Technically, the Hudson River is an estuary or a fjord. Remember that sea level during the ice age was hundreds of feet below the present sea level and the continental shelf was dry land. So the flow from Lake Iroquois, which was the impounded water cut through the continental shelf forming the Hudson, Fan Hudson Canyon, which is submerged by the ocean as the ice age ended. So again, this is the current, uh, current sea level, but the continental shelf is shown there, separating the light blue from the dark blue. And the sea level in, in ice age would be uh, And if you look at the topographic maps or the marine maps, in this case, you see the, you see the notches. You can see the notches, which are uh, what is called the Hudson Canyon, right where my mouse pointer is fortunately located. And it's, it's caused by the Hudson River eroding material away from the continental shelf and out into the ocean. Here's another picture of the Hudson Canyon showing, again, this is sort of a 3D view, but very well defined and shows on all the marine maps of the area. You may not have been familiar with it. And of course it's underwater in the New York Harbor. And in the early 20th century, it was used as a dump for city waste. So let's return to the present. So the sea level rose and the, ro and the sea level rise made uh, the Hudson River an estuary. Tide flows both, both ways up to Albany. And the features formed by the retreating glacier are still mostly visible. We talked about the drumlins, the, cal the moraines, the kettles. The ground had been compressed and has since rebounded. So some of the elevations are a matter of speculation. I used 200 feet. It, it might have been 300, in which case you'd all be wet. And stream flow into the Hudson River has affected the elevation of the bottom. But I think the basic idea is, is feasible for what, what happened because of the glacier. And as I mentioned before, the waterfalls of the hanging deltas formed by the emptying of Lake Albany were, were a valuable source of power for early settlers. So our guidebook has proven to be an invaluable resource for pointing out items that we would have missed otherwise, and has led us to an organized understanding of the effect of the Laurentide Ice Age in the Hudson Valley. And so thanks to uh, Robert and Johanna Titus for their excellent detective work and for an explanation of what we now see as Ice Age remnants. And we won't be seeing another Ice Age anytime soon. So thank you all, and I'll be happy to take questions uh, if I can answer them. I'm not a geologist, but I enjoy history, I enjoy science, and we, we can speculate since it's 20,000 years, nobody's going to prove us wrong.
I guess we're all asleep. All right. <laughs> Larry. Yes. So, I, so the question was, uh, in our area, if I if I take 200 feet elevation, current 200 feet elevation, as the shoreline of Lake Albany, would that have basically you know, predicted the flooding we get you know, in big rains? And the answer is basically yes. Uh, the, the picture that I showed, I guess I'm still on. The, the blue part there is basically showing that all of, of Springtown Road area and the area other than the, the parking lot for for the uh, the apartments on Huguenot Street is underwater. So, yeah. Connie. So the question was what to, do we know what caused the caves in Rosendale? Most of the caves in Rosendale are mines that were dug out to, to, to uh, extract uh, limestone of a particular composition that they made into cement. And not all, but that, you know, that's the, the Widow Jane mine is, a, is an old cement mine, for example. Yes. Um, I don't forget your first name. Uh, no, not just a minute. In back. Uh, so the question was Henry Du Bois, and this particular area is rolling country. And what's the exact uh, composition of that and what's caused it? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to answer that question. I don't know. It could be a mixture of moraines and just the fact that the river, Hudson River, isn't always been in its current boundaries. It could have been wider. And so there could have been water flow that would have shaped the land. Water is very corrosive in terms of. Um, um, moving things around, uh, but that would be an interesting. I'm sure somebody has, has studied that and there's probably master's thesis at New Paul's uh, done, done that, but I don't know. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about, so the question was, you know, the, the, the Hudson River is, we call it an estuary, and, but it's also called a river. And you know, what does all that mean? So naming of rivers is tricky, but you, you, start from, you start from the mouth and you work up and you decide, oh, this is the, this is the main water comes from here and then you turn right and then you turn left and eventually you get to a point where you can't find any any other source of water in the hudson river that's up in called lake of the tears in the, in the adirondacks near mount marcy so we we call that the hudson river there is of course a lot of other streams and rivers flowing into it into what we call the river and ultimately when of course we get to this area it's it's pretty wide now it turns out also that for this particular ge geographical phenomenon, that the surface of the river is at sea level all the way up to Albany. Not that cold spring, Albany. And if it's a sea level, it's subject to tides. And in fact, you know, if you're in Kingston and you're in the roundout and a full moon, 
and a, and a large tide, you have to worry about getting your feet wet, because it, because the tides are that are that big. Uh, but even in Albany, they they can be you know a, a few feet. The salt line, typically, I mean, which is a different question, right? But I'm but I'm guessing that you know perhaps that's being talked to you is that the the ocean is salty. Hudson River is basically not. There's some point at which salt and not salt, uh, there's, a, there's a line that somebody decides that this isn't very salty and this is. I don't know the, the formula for that, but that's usually somewhere around Cold Spring. On a, on a dry, in a, in a drought, where there's not enough water flowing into the Hudson, Hudson River, that moves up. And it moves up as, as far as the salt line moves up. If, the, if it moves up as far as Poughkeepsie, they have to look for a different drinking water source. Yeah. So the question is Breakneck Mountain and well, it's a Mount Beacon or something like that and Storm King that are like in the Hudson Highlands area, there's a lot of mountains and was that one continuous mountain range or one continuous mountain because the, the glacier was going to be above that and could have done all sorts of, of sculpting of that area. So it could be. Um, it, it certainly had, we think that Lake Albany was sort of stopped at that point. And then when Lake Albany broke through, then there was this huge gush of water that just took everything in front of its path. And that could have done, you know, moved a lot of, a lot of material. So, but I don't know specifically. Again, you can, you can make up your own story because, <laughs> You know, there, there isn't a lot of data, but there is, you know, you can get a professional geologist's opinion too. Well, I'm glad you didn't need your warm coats and thank you for your attention. And uh, I think it will be on YouTube uh, if, if you have your friends that couldn't see it and they want to watch it. And again, thank you all for coming. <laughs>